Good morning. I am Dr. Avlokita Agrawal, Assistant Professor at Department of Architecture and Planning, IIT Roorkee. Today, I am going to start the second lecture in the course on Sustainable Architecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the problems, the issues, why are we discussing about sustainable architecture or sustainability at large. And towards the end of the previous lecture, we saw what are the problems that we are facing today. Now as we move on, we will gradually be focusing more on the architecture and how architecture can be made sustainable, what are the ways to it. But before we really do that, we have to identify what are the problems with architecture or building activity. And before we even do that, we have to understand what is happening around us, why are we building. And when we are building, we are making these buildings, what are the issues, what are the problems. So through this lecture, second lecture, we would try to answer some of these questions. The first and the most pertinent one is, why at all do we build? Why are we making these buildings, all these different kinds of buildings which are there, why do we build them? The next, how buildings cater to our different needs? So when we answer why do we build, we build for our needs and how these buildings are catering to our needs, different needs. It might seem a very simple question and seemingly simple answer, but it is really not. So let us look into why are we building and how these buildings are catering to our needs and then are our needs changing with the change, changing requirement, changing environment, context as I say. So if the change in context is there, is there a change in our response which is needed too? So let us try to answer these questions through this lecture. So the first and foremost question is why do we build? We build for our needs and if we look at the Maslow's hierarchy where Sir Abraham Maslow proposed our needs be categorized in a hierarchical manner in a pyramid where at the bottom of it we have the physiological needs followed by the needs for safety and security, love and belonging, self-esteem and the final one is the need for self-actualization. So these are basic needs, the basic needs being the physiological needs without the fulfillment of physiological needs we cannot move ahead we cannot move up to fulfill our needs of self-esteem and self-actualization however many have argued that often to reach the need of self-actualization people have renounced the world and skipped all these needs these basic needs and directly jumped from the basic needs to the needs of self-actualization. However, that does not happen when these needs have never been fulfilled. It often happens when these needs have been fulfilled and then the person renounces them, renounces those needs and leads himself to the need of self-actualization. Now when I write here the need, want and value, there is a purpose to it. So we have a physiological need physiological need of protecting ourselves from the environmental adversities, the rain, the harsh weather, the animals around us. So these, this is the physiological need. We need to sleep, we need to keep ourselves comfortable. And then the need for safety, security, love and belonging where we, we want our family, our community to stay together with us. We have the need for our self-esteem. And then gradually that need transforms itself into a want. What I mean by it is I want a residence for myself, I want a home for myself, any individual because that is my physiological need. But instead of just wanting a home which is sufficient enough to fulfill the basic physiological need of mine, I want a 2 BHK house. And then I want a 3 BHK house and then I want a bungalow 
and I want this and I want that. So, my wants are arising out of the need, but they are not the basic needs as we understand. And gradually, the needs which have transformed themselves into wants, the wants will then transform this themselves into a value, value which is a collective value of a society, a cultural value. So, then culturally some things start getting valued. If you look at developed countries, now everyone will have a certain standard of living, a lifestyle which is what becomes the value. Here in India, in rural uh, communities, we might be valuing sustainability more or traditionally that is what uh, some of the native tribes across the world might have been doing, valuing the environmental resource more than the kind of lifestyle we are looking at. So, the need giving rise to wants has created a certain value system. Now, when we go on to understand what is it that we need and whether it is sustainable or not, we often confuse ourselves between the need, the want and the values of the society and we often weigh our requirements, the requirement for a building based upon the cultural value of that community and the context. So, it has to be very clearly understood and then examined whether what we are really wanting, looking for is a need or it is a transformed value based requirement. So, here we the physiological needs will help us to survive, the safety and security needs will help us to progress, the love and belonging the needs at this level help us to socialize because you know we are social people and then the need for self esteem helps us to achieve and self actualization is the topmost where we create we become creative something new. Let us look at how buildings have been providing for these needs. Now, this is one of the most primitive kind of homes that human beings have sheltered themselves in. Now, this was naturally available, man did not create, but he occupied a space like that and it fulfilled the very basic fundamental needs, the physiological needs and part of the safety needs, not security, safety, safety from animals, safety from uh, all other enemies of sorts. This is what it was. Gradually, it transformed to a group of these buildings which catered to the physiological needs as well as the safety needs because humans realized that staying together in groups and forming a community helped them stay safer because they are not the strongest of the people if they are along. Uh, strongest of the species living being. So, they are stronger when they stay together. So, they started staying together in groups and they formed these groups of houses, moved on to a more introvert planning like that very similar to the previous one, but instead of linear group of buildings, they moved into an enclosed group of building where a community was staying together fulfilling their physiological needs and safety needs at this level as well. Along with that they were able to fulfill their needs for belongingness, love because they were staying together, human beings would often do that. Then we see more permanent structures like this one Haveli which has been converted into a museum in Ludhiana, which was actually a Haveli, a residential building, a large one of course and of more permanent nature and moving from a temporary uh, hut kind of building to a permanent building like this that we see on the screen. Here it fulfills the physiological needs most definitely, 
safety and security needs. Now, here the kind of response that we see there are very less of openings, it is a courtyard building, it has a jolly parapet on the top of the uh, building where from outside people cannot actually see them using the terrace of their uh, house and it was because of the socio-political context of that place and those times where probably a lot of invasions were happening. So, this was the response to that. Now, if you compare, if we compare the previous building, the slide which I just shown this one to this one, we can very clearly see that it is quite resource intensive, but it is out and out a contextual response. So, whenever we are examining the buildings, the responses, we have to very clearly look at the con context to which each building or solution has responded to. We will come to that gradually. Let us look at couple of more examples here. Now, this is Jodhpur city. Now, here I am looking at a settlement and we are looking at fulfillment of physiological needs, safety and security needs, the needs for belongingness as a community, a bigger community, which also provides them the self esteem because they have created an identity for themselves, which we see happening almost all over the world in different settlements. This is Bungas of Rajasthan where along with the basic physiological safety and security and belongingness uh, uh, needs, they are creating an identity for themselves. And this identity is fulfilling the need for self esteem for them. Looking at the huts of Cameroon, so this physiological response if you look at this Bunga in Rajasthan to this hut in uh, Cameroon, both these places have similar kind of uh, climatic uh, requirement, a very harsh climate. So, uh, a very similar design response, the community requirement and the sense, the need for belongingness, the need for community to be staying together is similar. So, the response is also similar, but because of the resources which are available, the responses are varying slightly. So, here again we would see the physiological safety and security, belongingness and the need to create an identity which is the need for self esteem. So, buildings have been fulfilling all those needs, people have been creating identity, self esteem through the kind of responses, through the kind of buildings they have been creating. We move on to bigger buildings, say a fort. So, this is Mahawa Fort. Now, it fulfills physiological needs, safety and security needs. So, the security concerns in the times when these forts were constructed, the feudal age where there were a lot of wars uh, happening, a lot of uh, conflicts happening politically and this fort responds to that. So, the need for belongingness of a larger community, a state a riyasat uh, for example. So, the, this sense of belongingness was for a larger community and then the self esteem. So, this fort was a symbolism, a symbol of self esteem for the people of this entire state. Other forts, Narsingar fort, now physiological safety, security, belongingness, self esteem all these needs and in the process when all these needs were being fulfilled, people were becoming more and more creative. We can see a lot of creativity coming into architecture, which is actually fulfilling the last ladder, the tip of the needs which is for self actualization. Now, self actualization is not always spiritual, now, creativity all pursuits all different forms of art are actually taking us towards self actualization because we are becoming more and more creative. We are creating, we are not just responding to the needs, we are becoming more and more creative. Buildings help us fulfill that. 
all the forts Chittorgarh fort and this beautiful architecture that we see is actually the response to man's self actualization needs which is what we see here. Now, it is not only in the robust huge big buildings like forts, it is seen in the small residential buildings for example, this hut and the one and this hut being painted by Varli art. Now, this is using the most local, it is not permanent, it is temporary in nature, it is it gets uh, painted and repainted over and over again and then people create identity which is actually catering to their needs of self esteem and also self actualization through creation of this art form and that imparts them this identity and gives a sense of fulfillment through creativity. The culmination of this can be seen in a building like Taj Mahal. <coughs> Here we are looking at fulfillment of physiological safety security, we will come to that again, we will come to all these examples again and see whether they are doing that belongingness of course, self esteem and the pinnacle of it the self actualization. If we look at some of the chhatris, so we are looking at physiological probably safety and security was not as much a concern or it has not been catered to. Love belongingness which was the sole purpose of creating a, a building like this, a chhatri like this self esteem and self actualization through the creativity embedded. Now, in these two previous examples Taj Mahal and chhatri and all other examples where we see how people have been creative, we see how the need for self actualization has been fulfilled. While in some of the buildings like this one, this is Takshila University, the need for self actualization has been fulfilled through the purpose of the building or purpose of the built environment itself. So, the need for creation of a university a place where people come the community at large comes together and acquires knowledge itself is a purpose which takes us towards self actualization. So, it is not just by virtue of the beautiful architecture we can still see a lot of uh, motives and uh, uh, the kind of architecture which we are seeing here. So, not just by virtue of what has been created in the physical sense but by virtue of its purpose itself and then the pinnacle of it say in terms of Khandariya Mahadev where religion has been depicted. Now, religion often has been a vehicle a medium for people to for self actualization fulfilling the need for self actualization and creation of a building like this strengthens reinforces or helps us fulfill as a community the need for self actualization. Again the need for safety and security have been overpowered by the need for belongingness, self esteem and self actualization here or in one of the Chaitya halls uh, we again see that the need for self actualization has been fulfilled more than the need for safety and security. Of course, the need for safety and security was also, also fulfilled by virtue of the location of this building where it has be, been constructed, where it has been built, but other needs are more pronounced here. So, we build for different reasons, we build for different purposes and each of this reason and purpose actually defines, fulfills some of the need and defines the purpose of human existence itself. Now, the question comes can we sustain the building activity? So, can we sustain the building activity for all the above buildings which have which I have shown above? If yes, they are sustainable and if no, then probably they are not sustainable and if no, then why not can we sustain them? Let us go over each of these examples again and see if they are examples of sustainable buildings can they be sustained in simple terms before even talking about the definition or the proper understanding of what a sustainable building or a sustainable architecture would be. We would try to see in very common layman terms 
whether this building can sustain or not. Let us look at of each of this example. Can we sustain this? Yes, of course. Why? Simply because there is no environmental resource which has been consumed, there is no economic resource which has been consumed, no manpower is required. However, in today's times, if you question, can we start living in these caves? No. I don't say that because we have a certain lifestyle expectation, even if we were comfortable living in these caves, we would not be able to live in these because there is a limit to how many such accommodations may be made available because it is naturally available. Yes, we can sustain it from an environmental point of view, but from a societal point of view probably we may not be able to sustain that. It will not provide accommodation to billions and billions of people that we have around. Can this type of uh, uh, an accommodation or building be sustained? Yes, because it consumes very limited environmental resource, it requires almost no economic resource, it requires limited manpower for which humans have developed the skill. So, this can be sustained, yes, it is sustainable. This one, yes, again for the same reasons we can sustain it, we can sustain it. Can this one be sustained? Well, maybe. When I was discussing about this example, we talked about the context for which this kind of an architecture was developed. So, there were a lot of invasions happening, there were a lot of fights being uh, taking place. So, yes, it consumes significant environmental resource, it consumes significant economic uh, resource and high amount of manpower is required. But from socio-cultural point of view, if we look at the utility of this building, so each of this Haveli was housing hundreds of people of a large extended family. So one large building was not for a small family, it was for a larger number of people. So the utilitarian perspective comes into picture here and for that context it was appropriate. In today's context, it may still remain appropriate, contextual and hence it may sustain or if the socio-cultural context has totally changed, then it may not sustain. Here we are looking at a larger community like Jodhpur city, part of it. Can we sustain? Well, maybe because some environmental resources required, some economic resources also required, significant manpower is also required, but again the individual building's utility is what governs, defines whether this can sustain or not. So, each building has a smaller footprint or it has a larger utility for human beings. This one Again, yes, we can sustain provided we have the required skill which we need to make these buildings because it has very less environmental resource consumption and less economic resource consumption, but significant manpower is required along with the skill which is required to construct them. Yet, we can still sustain it provided our socio-cultural requirements allow that. Same for these huts from uh, Cameroon, the reasons are exactly the same. Now this one, can we sustain? No, not at all. There is a huge environmental resource which is required, there is a huge economic resource which is required and huge manpower is required to construct this building. In those times, it was socio-culturally politically required and hence all these resources, environmental, economic and social resource were brought together. It was never easy on a kingdom to construct a fort and hence each kingdom, each king probably would have very few limited forts which were made and they doubled up or multiple purposes they served. They served as the palace, part of the fort was also the palace for the leader, the king. 
in terms in times of distress when there was a war being raged against the kingdom the people were given protection in this fort which was the uh, another purpose at times the fort served as cities which were like walled cities so suppose you look at the jaisalmer fort the fort itself is the entire city so in those times in those uh, contexts they were contextual and hence they were able to sustain in today's times as the socio cultural context has changed we cannot gather the environmental economic and social resource which is required to create a building like that all of the forts for the same reason cannot be constructed and that is why we see that in today's times we do not construct these forts they are socially culturally obsolete and they are so resource intensive that we just cannot think of building that however this kind of a building where it is least resource consuming can still continue however we still see that a lot of worldly art is not being done these days though there are uh, efforts towards revival of these art forms these creative forms but yet because there is a significant manpower which is uh, required it is declining wherever there is a lot of resource consumption of either types it is difficult to sustain that unless there is a socio cultural context which keeps it going provides it that impetus to go forward to sustain itself so we see that yes ideally it should sustain but just because is it requires significant manpower and skill it is difficult to sustain this activity can we create another taj mahal we cannot it's not that we do not have the required uh, skill or designers who can design a taj mahal we are designing different types of buildings but yet we are not doing that though we are doing we making different types of buildings but this is not example of a sustainable building at all it requires huge environmental resource it requires huge economic resource and huge manpower we cannot make such buildings again and there is not much of utilitarian purpose a chatri again the same thing huge resources are required and that is why we see that these buildings say taj mahal or these chatri or uh, i'm not talking about uh, a structure like this but uh, kandariya mahadev now these structures these kinds of structures are not being constructed simply because they consume huge amount of resource and in turn in return they are not really utilitarian in nature however if you look at this example which is of a university one of the greatest universities in recorded history though it consumes huge environmental resource it consumes huge economic resource and it also consumes huge manpower to construct it to build it but it has a large utilitarian purpose because of which this kind of a building by purpose as i mean i'm not saying by design are still sustaining we are seeing more and more universities coming up why because they are not for one person they are not for a select audience they are for a larger mass they are utilitarian in nature so we have couple of bottom lines we come down to the answer to our question what is it we talking about architecture what is it that sustains so what sustains first which has least environmental impact anything which has lesser environmental impact will sustain over a similar response which has larger environmental impact second least resource consuming something which consumes huge economic resource is not sustainable labor intensive where people own the outcome here 
anything which is labor intensive if people own the outcome in terms of building or the purpose of the building may be sustained however if it is not owned by people anything which is labor intensive may not sustain and the last utilitarian in nature for everyone if we are looking at purpose of the building which is being constructed for a select few very few people a community a class type of people it will not be sustaining we will not see many of such buildings coming in since it is not utilitarian in nature so if we look at this discussion conclusion of this entire lecture discussion we know what kind of buildings sustain in the longer run many of you might have questions on the types of buildings which which are coming up highly resource intensive buildings for example say five star hotels which are highly resource consuming but you see that they there are not many five star hotels which you would see there are fewer of them very few of them because they are catering to a select class of people group of people they are not utilitarian in nature that's why it is not a very sustainable building and hence not many are being constructed however on the other hand if you look at residence because it is fulfilling the most fundamental of the needs and it is more utilitarian you would see that more and more residences in the time to come come will be built they will be required more and more so i will conclude this lecture by drawing the bottom line for sustainable development of which sustainable architecture is a subset so we see that there is environment as a bottom line anything that is a uh, an impeachment not impeachment but that is actually taking a larger portion of the environment is not sustainable so anything which consumes less environmental resource will be sustainable anything that is benefiting to the economy where economy flourishes or it doesn't take a larger portion of the economy for a smaller purpose is sustainable and last it is useful for the society from its utility purpose and also from its cultural context anything that is contextual culturally and has a larger utilitarian purpose is what will sustain now if you look at any example any building now that's a point to ponder if you look at any building and try to evaluate it from any of these purposes you would see whether that building would sustain or not sustain if we look at some of the beautiful examples of huge havelis which were created in any part of the country rajasthan or uh, kerala or tamil nadu or wherever any building which has been abandoned say these havelis either of the these three bottom lines may not be meeting may not be fulfilled in those cases we would very clearly see one of these being violated over the time either the context has changed the socio cultural context has changed or the building is not serving any utility it is it is not a utilitarian building or it is intensive on economy resource economic resource or environmentally resource intensive either of these three would fail a building any development on the other hand anything which fulfills this bottom line will be seen as sustaining so i will close the second lecture by leaving this last slide with you and we would start our next lecture from here itself where through a venn diagram this is the most generic definition of uh, sustainable development which we would we would find where these three circles intersecting circles each denoting environment social 
uh, bottom line and economic bottom line where these three come together the confluence of that is sustainable development. So, if any one of these three dimensions is not fulfilled it is not going to be a sustainable solution. So, if it is not fulfilling the economic it is only bearable, if it is not fulfilling the social requirement it is viable, if it is not fulfilling the environmental uh, bottom line it is equitable but not sustainable. So, we would start our next lecture, lecture 3 from understanding what sustainability is, what are the different definitions of sustainability, how definitions of sustainability have changed over years, over different ages, periods and what have caused that change to happen, what has inflicted that change. This is what we will see in our next lecture. Thank you very much for listening with patience, see you in lecture 3, thank you.